and to delight ourselves in the Lord. You know, this, this whole world system, this present evil world and the devil and the flesh conspire together to capture our affections. Yes. And just to draw us away, not necessarily even to wicked and evil things, but just to anything but Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And so I appreciate that challenge. There was definitely some things that I'm pondering and, and uh, praying on. So that was good stuff. I appreciate a man of God who knows the Lord and knows the Bible and brings it to the pulpit. Um, all right. Good stuff. Let's do this. We're going to we're going to go ahead and have you guys turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 tonight. And uh, I'm going to go ahead to 1 John chapter 5. If you're extremely adept, you can do both. Um, it's just good to, be, good to be in church tonight. So yeah, what I'd like yeah. to do tonight is um, anytime that we can consider the cross of Jesus Christ, anytime that we can consider what God did to bring us to Himself. It's profitable. And there are so many angles you can look at it from. You can look at the humanity of Christ and what He went through. You can look at the deity of Christ and how you know, only the God-man could be the sacrifice. You could look at uh, how He came unto His own and His own received Him not. You could look at Him as, as the Messiah who was rejected. So many ways. Tonight, what I'd like us to do is I'd like us to consider God the Father in the work of redemption. God the Father in the work of, the, of redemption. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7 says this, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Amen. See, God has always operated in perfect harmony, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There's yeah. never been a disagreement or a schism or, or a uh, uh, you know, uh, lack of oneness. And so they were all in on this plan of redemption. Amen. But each kind of has a different facet. And so, the, you know, again, they, they've all been involved together in whatever God has been doing. We do, however, tend to see one member of the Trinity as more prevalent or at the forefront, kind of in each, each section of the Bible or each dispensation. Of course, God the Father being more to the forefront in the Old Testament, God the Son during His earthly ministry, and now God the Holy Spirit is primarily how God interacts with man in this dispensation. But, um, you know, when we think about redemption and all of their involvement in it, we have to go back to the book of Genesis to really appreciate God the Father's place and role in involving all this. So I'm going to turn back there with you, and then we'll have a word of prayer. I'd ask you to pray with me and for me as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the singing we've heard. We thank you for the moving hymns that we've heard. We thank you for the man of sorrows. What a name for the Son of God who came. And I picture you standing there with the thorn of crowns on your head and blood running down your face and knowing that I deserve that and much more and you deserve none of it. And you weren't there as a martyr. You were there to lay down your life. Lord, what a Savior. And uh, so, Lord, I pray that you will be lifted up tonight. I pray that God's people would be edified and I pray that all men uh, under the sound of this message will be drawn to Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for it. Pray you put me behind the cross and under the blood that I might give forth your word faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. In the beginning, verse 1, God created the heaven and the earth. And you know the story. Verse 4, God saw the light that it was good. And uh, everything that he made, verse 10, God saw that it was good. Verse 12, God saw that it was good. When he brought forth the trees and the plants and the fruits. Yeah. Verse 18, he created the sun and the moon and so forth. God saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. Verse 21, the animals. God saw that it was good. Everything was good. Yeah. And in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God the Father in redemption, God gave a great start. Yeah, he gave right. a great start. See, we, we look at this broken world and, and people ask, well, how could God make such a world? He didn't make such a world. God made a perfect place. God placed sinless humans, innocent humans in a tropical paradise where there was no hurt, no harm, no illness, no, no problems of any kind. Everything was perfect. Everything was what you wish it would be when you take a tropical vacation. 
if you think about it, think about the vacations that people plan. Think about the things that the, the environmentalists and the, the New Worlders and the liberals are all trying to bring about. They're trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. Yeah, yeah. They're trying to get humanity back to running around freely in a tropical paradise with not a care in the world. The problem is they can't do that because they can't deal with sin. Yeah. Only in a sinless environment can we get back to Eden. But that's where it started. God gave a great start. God made everything beautiful in his time. And the devil's lie, as we've talked about before, was that what God gave us wasn't good enough. Yeah, that's right. There was the, the one thing, a garden of yes and a tree of no, as Pastor Andy uh, likes to say, and, and there was one thing that God said, hey, that's not good for you. Leave that one alone. Yeah. And mankind, under the uh, deception and instruction of the devil, said, got to have it. Got to have it. Why? Because fundamentally, everything that I see around me that's bounty and this wonder that I have from God's great start, it's just not enough, God. And folks, let me just say, in Romans chapter 1, there's a downward spiral yeah, that begins right. with unthankfulness. Yeah. We got to watch unthankfulness in our lives because when we say to ourselves, this isn't good enough, whatever it is, this isn't good enough, or my house isn't good enough, my, my job isn't good enough, my town isn't good enough, my life isn't good enough. Now look, if there's things that are broken or can be improved, praise the Lord, work on it, work on it. Amen. But if we begin to say, God hasn't been good enough to me, yeah, come on, preacher. we're in the devil's playground. Yeah. We, are, we are primed for the devil's deception, we are primed for some serious error, and we're going to find out that whatever we were in, was far better than what we're fixing to go into. When yeah, we say right. God hasn't been good enough. So God gave a great start in Genesis chapter 1. Now Genesis chapter 2, we see that God formed man of the dust of the ground. We have some more detail here. God brought a, a wife to Adam. And God gave him the instruction. And in Genesis chapter 3, we're three, three chapters into the Bible and everything's perfect. But what goes wrong in chapter 3? Sin. Yeah. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Yeah. Mankind took through the knowledge of good and evil, and as a result, we have sin. We have death. We have the curse. We have illness. We have a childhood disease. We have wars. We have famines. We have predatory animals and, and uh, predator and prey animals. The, the, the harmony that pervaded everything has been shattered. And the way I like to think of it is God made this masterpiece of, of a world and man broke it. And we, we look all around us and we see a very broken world and it's getting more broken and more brokener every day. And we see the things that people are doing to each other and to themselves and toward God. And we say, what a mess this is. You know, when... Adam and Eve thought they were doing something very simple, just picking a fruit off a tree and having a bite. In other words, they couldn't foresee all of this that we've seen since then, 6,000 years of pain and suffering and, and woe. But God knew all of that. God could see that that single seed of sin was going to just blossom and pervade everything. And so if you were God and these two humans that you'd made and given all of this and made them king and queen of the world, and they rejected what you said, and they chose the devil over you, and they broke your one rule, and they broke your entire planet. And you could see all of the suffering that was going to come, and all of the woe, and all the wickedness, and all of the offense against you. What would you have done? I'm going to tell you that the second thing God did in the work of redemption is God gave great mercy. God gave great mercy. You know the story. Adam and Eve are there. They've tried to cover their, their nakedness with fig leaves. And I think it's very instructive and it's very, uh, um, uh, what's the word? It's a picture of, of man-made religion. Yes. Is that they made these aprons to cover themselves. And no doubt they put a lot of effort and time into them. But when God showed up and it really mattered, Adam said he was still naked. God said, where are you? And he said, ah, I hid because I was naked. Well, he's wearing an apron. The apron might be fine to live by, but it ain't fine to die by. Yeah. False religion or man-made religion might be fine to make you feel better than your neighbor, but it's not enough to calm your conscience right. and give you that sweet rest on your pillow at night. Yeah. Whatever we can manufacture that's not of God, 
It might work in, in a limited sense with the right group, but when it really counts, you'll say, I'm still naked. I'm still undone. I'm still ashamed. And so we need what God has. So what did God do? He came looking for man, not for judgment, but God brought a sacrifice to man. God killed those animals and made the coats of skin. So when man looked for judgment, God brought mercy. And again, you got to put yourself in the Father's place. Look what man has just done, and you as God know everything that's going to come from it. And instead of squashing man like a fly, God said, Come here, Adam. Let's take care of this. Let's deal with this. I'm going to show you mercy. Amen. That was a great, God gave great mercy after his great start. You know what else, though? God gave great hope. Yeah. Look at Genesis chapter 3. And look at verse 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Do you realize that in the day of man's fall, in the very day, God gave the first prophecy Amen. of the Savior? Yeah, that's good. After he gave a great start and man messed it up, and after he gave great mercy, God gave great hope. Yes. He, he, he came to Eve and Adam, and he clothed them from their nakedness, and he shed the blood to cover their sins. And he said, Eve, there's a sin, or excuse me, there's a seed coming Amen. to the woman. That's a prophecy of the virgin birth. That's right. Seed comes through the man, not the woman. And so God gave a great hope. And don't you know, I mean, you, you can read when, when she bore Seth after the whole Cain and Abel thing. She said, for God, said, see, said she, hath appointed me another seed. Don't you know that every baby boy that was born, Eve was thinking, is this the one? Is this the one? She didn't know how long it was going to be. When the fullness of time was come, Jesus Christ came. Amen. But God gave great hope. He not only dealt with their sins in the moment, but he gave a prophecy that one day I'm going to set this right. I'm going to set this right, said God. Yeah. After you broke it. And I have every right to judge you and destroy this entire universe right now. I'm going to give a prophecy. I'm going to give you great hope. And that hope has sustained God's people for thousands of years. And may I say also, for those of us that are born again, God deals... Look, didn't God bring us forgiveness? When we sought His mercy, when we understood what Jesus did for us, God gave us forgiveness and God helps us to deal with with the consequences and the, and the shortcomings of our sinful flesh every day. Praise the Lord. But hasn't God given us great hope? Yes. See, there's coming a day, the redemption of our body, whether it's after we go to the grave or whether we are the privileged few that get to be in the rapture, mm -hmm. we're going to be with Jesus. Amen. And every single sin will be forgotten. Every single amount of sinfulness will be taken away. One of the greatest miracles God will ever do is to get every bit of sin out of a sinner. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. Yes. And so we have a great hope. Not just these folks had a great hope that the Savior was coming. We have a great hope that he's been once and he's coming for us again. Amen. You know, 1 Peter chapter 1, let's turn there real quick. We can't fully understand God, but if we try to see things from his perspective once in a while, it'll help us. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. According to this uh, passage and others, before God ever created the foundation of the world, He had a plan of redemption in place. Fully knowing that people were going to disappoint Him, He had a plan to redeem them. And may I say, when we, when we deal with our children and when we deal with uh, believers that we're discipling, uh, let's plan on them disappointing us. It'll, it'll help us to be a little bit more merciful and a little bit more gracious as we look out to the end of all things and we say, you know what? 
Train up a child on the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Doesn't mean he won't wiggle around a little bit in the meantime. Uh, when, when we see a brother or a sister that we're trying to help and they, uh, not, not to say that we don't intervene, but I'm just saying let's, let's try to take the long look and not have expectations that they will perfectly receive every instruction that we give them like we did God. Because we, we didn't do that with God. We ourselves, as Pastor Andy said, we're all dealing with our own issues. All right? So God gave great hope in that moment. But you know what? Throughout the scripture, throughout history, God's painted so many great pictures of Jesus Christ. How about the flood? How about the flood? You know, judgment is coming on the world, the entire world. And God says to Noah, build an ark. And Noah, the Bible says they went in the ark. They went in the door that was in the side of the ark which is a bad place to put a door on a boat. And the Bible says that they went into the ark and God shut them in. And he sealed that door so well that when Noah wanted to leave the ark later, he had to take off the roof. He removed the covering of the ark. So they went in the door. Jesus said, I am the door. God sealed them in. And then they went out the roof. Just like us. We went in the door, Jesus Christ. God sealed us with his Holy Spirit. And one day we're going out the roof. Praise the Lord for that. How about the ram caught in a thicket? Genesis 22, when, when God told uh, Abraham to, Isaac, to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac didn't know it. And many people around you and I don't know it. But he was condemned, according to the word of God, to death and flames. He was going to be killed and sacrificed as a burnt offering. And there he goes on his way. And God provided a substitute. That's a picture of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Interestingly enough, if you read the story, God didn't provide a lamb there. Abraham said, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. God provided a ram in that story. Why? Because the lamb he was talking about was Jesus Christ. How about the Passover in Exodus chapter 12? Again, judgment is coming. The death angel is coming. There's no escape except for the blood of a lamb. All throughout history in type uh, God has provided pictures of that great hope, yeah. which leads us to this. God gave the greatest gift, mm-hmm. his only begotten son. You know the verse, you can quote it uh, as well as I can. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, Amen. but have everlasting life. Amen. You think about this, the holy, holy, holy one, high and lifted up far above all things, he sent his son to be treated like dirt by those he had made of dirt. Sometimes we have a harder time as humans. We can put up with people mistreating us, but when they touch someone that we love, it's almost harder for us to forgive that offense against another who's close to us. Can you imagine God the Father? I know, he, I know this was his plan, but I have to think, I, I picture that when the, when the sky went dark and the earth quaked, I just picture that God was holding back his wrath. You know, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And, and to see his beloved son in whom he was well pleased and to see the sinners. I mean, think about this. Just, just picture the, the Roman soldiers who were whipping them. And not only are they brutal Roman soldiers who have no right to treat him that way. But God, the Father, can look down and he knows everything that guy's ever done. He knows just how much that soldier deserves to be dropped into hell right now. God, God can look down and he can see those high priests, those priests that were supposed to point people to God, those people that were supposed to draw the nation and teach them the laws and the statutes, and they were taking bribes, and they were devouring widows' houses, and they were the biggest hypocrites in the land, and those wicked men are rejecting God himself, and they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him, in hatred. Folks, there's no human, I don't care how mellow you are, I don't care how kindly you are, not one of us could have stood by while our child went through that, knowing everything that God knows and done anything but smite him. God gave the greatest gift. It's it's one thing for us to see the cute little rosy-cheeked baby Jesus in a manger at Christmas time. Oh, yeah, God gave the greatest gift. Isn't that nice? Sure, it's nice. But that's not really the whole story of what God gave. 
It's not really a whole story of what it cost God the Father when he was separated for the first time from his son and Jesus Christ cried out. Do you ever have your child cry out in genuine terror or agony? I remember, um, I don't think I can tell that story right now. There was a time when, uh, when one of my children was in great terror. In it, there was a medical situation, and uh, the long and the short of it is, I had to help hold them down while the doctors did what they needed to do to make them okay. And my child is crying out, and I'm a part of what they're terrified of at that moment. That was incredibly hard. And the, the doctor there was like, you're doing okay, Dad. You're doing okay. If you've ever had your child in that place, maybe you could do something about it, maybe you couldn't. When Jesus Christ cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, God could have at that moment, 12 legions of angels, get it done. He didn't. He gave the greatest gift. He punished his own son for your sin and for my sin. And you know, I, I think about this a lot. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. You know, he could have gotten glory by ascending judgment. That would glorify a holy and just God. Justice has been done. Smite. God didn't save us. He, he gets glory. Oh, he does. Amen. But the Bible records, for God so loved the world that he gave. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. God showed the greatest heart. God the Father looked at his enemies and wanted to adopt us as his children. So look, at, uh, look at Romans chapter 5. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is in Romans chapter 5. But God commendeth his love toward us, verse 8, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, Jesus Christ didn't die for us on our best day. He died for us on our worst day. Mm, that's right. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. God looked at, at, at a planet full of enemies. And having all power to do whatever he pleased, he said, I want that one for my child. And I want that one to be saved. And I want that one to be rescued. And I want to change her life. And I want to fix his life. And I want to put this planet and these people back together. And I want them all in my family. Whosoever. Amen. Amen. You realize the worst person you've ever dealt with, God wants them to Amen. be saved. The worst person you can think of in the history of the world, Jesus Christ shed his blood for them. And, and if they would have come, God said, whosoever will. And so God showed the greatest heart in welcoming all to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. There's no God like that. There's no religion like that. There's no person. Just think of God for a moment. I know he's God. But think of him as a person for a moment. There's nobody like that. There's nobody like that. Lastly. God gives a great invitation that requires a response. Yes. We, just, we just talked about it. Whosoever will, whosoever believeth in him. Folks, this is not something that we can put off. You know, some of the Jews remained undecided. You know, Jesus went up to the feast and said, well, he's a good man. Well, he deceives the people. And they were, well, we'll wait and see. God's merciful and God's long-suffering. But this invitation... Folks, we cannot look at what God has done for us and remain unmoved. Yeah. We cannot look at what, what it cost the Father to give the Son and what it cost the Son to come. And we can't just say, well, let me think about it some more. That's a rejection. Yeah. That's a rejection of what God has done for us. Right now, the doors of mercy are open. Amen. But there's coming a final moment of opportunity for every one of us. It might be when the trumpet blows. It might be our last breath. We're not promised tomorrow. And, and, and that's, please understand, that's not a scare tactic, but what I'm saying is, if you received an invitation that said, please RSVP, and you, you don't respond at all, yes or no, you're disrespecting the sender. 
And this great invitation demands a response. I hope tonight you've already responded in the affirmative. I hope you've already received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I hope you have not neglected this great salvation procured for us. But if you're here tonight and, and you're not saved, I would encourage you to seek out one of the pastors after the service. We would love nothing better than to take a Bible and show you how you can know that Jesus is your Savior and you're on your way to heaven. Now, for those of us who are saved, I sometimes like to ask this question. And it, and it goes along with what Pastor Andy was talking about this morning. How are you treating God these days? He who's done so much for us, have we been neglecting him in our daily life? Having received his invitation and come into his family and been purchased with his blood, are we more interested in the news feed or the sports or whatever it might be? I was convicted this morning because I, I, this very morning I got distracted during my morning devotions a little bit. And I try to carve out time and get up early before anybody else is, is awake so that I can uh, attend upon the Lord without distraction for that time in the morning. But, man, sometimes I'm just, we're, we're so flighty sometimes. And our Lord deserves better. You know? Amen. And so I'm not going to re-preach Pastor Andy's sermon. Go back and watch it again. <laughs> but I'm just saying, how are we treating this God who's done all this for us? Yeah. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so 